Welcome to the Vegan Plant-Based Summit. Thanks for joining me here. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. So where are you now? Where, what part of America are you calling from? Well, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, so I'm pretty much in the center of the United States. So tell me about your story. Tell me your personal story. Where did Clarence begin? So I'm originally from Illinois. Um, I moved around a little bit, so... Pretty much raised in Illinois, different parts of Illinois, Chicago, uh, outskirts of Chicago, different places around Illinois. I've lived in Kansas City, Missouri. I've lived in Las Vegas. And now I reside in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. So what sort of background do you come from and what sort of diet were you raised on? So I hate to say it like this, but a typical black diet, I guess. So a lot of soul food, a lot of meat, a lot of pastas and starches, so macaroni and cheese. Uh, really growing up, you would have vegetables, but as kids, you know, kids, I don't really want to eat it. It's nasty, it's disgusting, so we don't really eat it too much, but it was mostly meats, mostly carbs, mostly things of that nature, sweets and junk foods. So when did you become vegetarian? So I've been a vegetarian for 10 years now, uh, total, about 10 years. I've tried to do the vegan thing. Uh, my problem with being a vegan is the convenience. I'm, I'm a single man, uh, real busy at times. And so sometimes I just have to stop somewhere. So I don't eat a lot of stuff out of the animal, but I do still eat cheese occasionally and like butter and chocolate, stuff like that, that actually are, have milk products in it. So, you know, not, not vegan. So what was it that inspired you to go vegetarian in the first place? So as far as the actual vegetarian diet well i've always been healthy i've always played sports i've always felt like i ate pretty good but as far as the vegetarian diet it, was, it did a lot with reading so this was around my college years and stuff so probably late 90s uh i really started reading about it and i kind of started taking meats out of my diet so in the late 90s probably around 98 90 something like that in college i read a book called uh how to eat to live by elijah muhammad it broke down all the different animals and so at that point, I started taking things away from my diet. So not 100% vegetarian, but I took the pork out first. Then the next was the beef. When I actually became a full-time uh, vegetarian, I was only eating chicken and fish at this time. And what I did was I went on a 21-day diet. And now it's been tw uh, 10 years. It's like I went on a 10-day 10, 10 diet to see if I could take all meat out of my diet. And I didn't go 100% vegan, but I took all meats out of my diet. And uh, I never came off of it. And tell me about the connection between your diet and Dr. Sebi. Um, we've heard from, about Dr. Sebi from one of the other um, interviewees, but tell me about how Dr. Sebi influenced your journey. So he basically talks about food is medicine. We can go to the doctor every day. We can get a little pill, a shot that might kind of help fix the issue for momentarily, but it's not going to clear up your system 100%. If you change the way that you eat, uh, basically your life will change. So... Clarence, there's a reason why you say you're not vegan and it's not out of personal preference, is it? It's out of the where you actually live and what's available to you. I'm not 100% vegan. Now, I could be. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to like some people try to say money and finances and stuff like that. That's not it. But like I said, I do move around a lot and I, I pretty much prepare my own food or at times I have to stop somewhere and eat at a restaurant or something like that. And I live in the South, I live in Memphis, Tennessee. So down here, it's not a big population of vegetarians, vegans, anything of that nature. You know, a lot of our people, even with fitness, fitness is not the biggest here either. A lot of our uh, population down here are overweight, I hate to say it, um, but it is by how we eat. Uh, so as black Americans, our tradition is, with that, like I said, soul food, big family dinners and a lot of meat, a lot of, like I said, it's everything. So there's vegetables included, but it's a lot of pastas, a lot of chicken, a lot of 
ham, steak, uh, every, everything you can think of, but mostly meat, you know, and that's the way people pretty much eat. I remember when I first came down here, I was working at a, a place and they had like a little potluck thing. They brought all kinds of stuff everybody brought, but it was pretty much uh, all meat. Everywhere I pretty much go in like jobs like this, they'll have nothing but meat. So I'm sitting there trying to figure out what I'm going to eat. So I'm trying to find sides I can eat. But then even with that, to be vegan, you have like milk-based products that are in pretty much everything. So if you have, uh, let me say, if somebody makes some potato salad or something, it might have something in there that's going to have some animal in it, some kind of milk, some kind of mayonnaise or something like that that has some kind of milk product in it. So it's very hard to be vegan where I'm at. Uh, I could do it, though. I'm not going to say I could do it. You have two stories to tell. One is your professional athlete story, and the other one is the the one that you've dedicated your life to, and that is helping um, youth and vulnerable adults. Um, tell us about the um, professional athlete side of things first. Uh, so I'm actually an older athlete. I'm 42 years old, but I do professional calisthenics. So I've been in uh, calisthenics is the study of body weight exercise, basically. But people have took it to the extreme now. So a lot of people compare it to gymnastics, except for the difference is you use your own creative uh, style. Gymnastics is all about uh, being technical, points and straight up and down and everything. Calisthenics is the net. Calisthenics is see how you can make your body move around these bars, how many different crazy moves you can do or come up with yourself, create. So it's people that just invent moves. And so it's really like an art form. I get to be myself on the bar. I, I don't compare myself to anybody else. I don't try to necessarily do the same moves as them. I try to be original. I try to, and even with the competitions, they judge you off of certain different things. Uh, dynamics are all the fast moves, motions, the spins, the twists. Then they got things like statics, which are the handstands and front levers and things like that, where you just hold your body in a, a position. And then it's just overall creative expression. How do I win the crowd? If me and you are in a battle and we're competing, who did the crowd like the best? <laughs> so, yeah. So it's not like gymnastics, which is 100% technical. He did this. He did that. You know, so it's a little different. Um, as far as that, like I said, I'm 42 years old. So I compete with 16-year-olds. I compete with 20-year-olds and stuff like that. And one thing that I can say, I have a lot of energy. I don't know if it's because I don't eat meat. But I can tell that my diet is a lot different than a lot of people's diets and stuff like that. And a lot of people do, even by seeing my physique, like, I can't believe you're the age that you are, you know, and it's, it's really a lot. A lot of it is my diet. Obviously, when you are exercising, when you are performing at a professional standard, there has to be a mind body connection. Can you explain how that mind body connection is helped by a vegetarian diet? I just believe for myself. Being a vegetarian, uh, I really believe that it just helps with everything. It gives me a lot of energy. Um, I just feel different. Uh, that's the reason I never went back to it. Like I said, I went on a 21-day diet. And in them 21 days where I cut all meat out of my diet, I seemed like I had a lot of energy, little things like headaches and sicknesses and stuff. I really don't get sick that, that often no more. And not saying that it's 100% fact, because a lot of stuff you'll hear me say will come from my mind right here, the mind of golden. But how to eat to live explain that people eat once once a day, like pretty much the same time so that you can allow whatever you ate to get 100 percent out of your system before you re put something else in there. They said if you can learn how to eat like once every other day or once every three days, you'll never get sick. Now, I'm not sure how true that is because I don't I don't do that. But I have realized that I don't get sick like I used to. Like when I was younger, I, I would get sick. I would get colds. I would get all this stuff now. Knock on wood or something because I don't want to get sick tomorrow because I'm sitting there saying this but I really don't get sick too often. And that's a common theme that we've seen going through all of these interviews is that once you cut out meat from your diet and the dairy, um, you start to have more energy and feel better. And people whose joints used to hurt no longer hurt. And the, the cloudiness from your brain, it just disappears. I mean, these are, these are amazing health benefits that people are seeing. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Clarence, was you have your own business um, um, teaching people how to do um, what you do at a professional level. How do you train them? How do you train them to do these, um, these things I could only dream of doing, like walking up an imaginary wall 
what is it diet and exercise no not at all so it's really about the individual person now i train calisthenics so all body weight so i'm going to start with like a lot of people when they think about fitness the first thing they think about is going to somebody's gym and picking up some weights now that's not necessarily the best thing for your body because even though my arm might be heavy enough, uh, my arm might be strong enough to pick up this weight, my legs might be strong enough to pick up this weight, that doesn't mean my back is going to be able to take it. So you have to kind of build your foundation first. So I, I, I encourage everybody to start off with just regular body weight exercises, push-ups, pull-ups, body weight squats, just using nothing but your body, no kind of extra resistance at all. But when that becomes too easy, that's when you start act, adding extra weight and stuff to build your strength up. Now, as far as what I do, that's going to be depending on the individual person. The people who are going to gravitate towards that are the people who are going to want to do it. Like, like if you came to my gym and you decided to work out with me and you started on the, be the beginner at the basic level, the only way I would go to an extreme level with you is if I seen that you were getting what I was teaching you and that you said, I want to learn how to do that. I can't make somebody do something. That's just like they say people who play instruments. They say, if you want to know if your kid is going to be able to play the piano, first thing you got to do is get a keyboard and put it in that house. If that kid looks at that piano, that keyboard, and plays with it one time and never plays with it again, that kid, you can't teach that kid how to play the piano because that kid doesn't want to learn how to play the piano. But if that kid just constantly goes over to it and constantly keep playing with it and keep messing around with it, you can teach that kid how to learn how to play the piano. Why? Because they're interested in it. That's the same thing with this gym right here. If a person doesn't want to do that, they're never going to ask me, like, hey, man, how do I do this? Or can you show me this? Or can you do that? But if they have that intention or if they want to do it, they're going to let me know that. And then they're going to be easy to train. How does your professional life as a professional athlete move over into what you do with the children and with the youth and with the vulnerable adults? OK, so to go a different way, my full time job is I work in the behavioral health field. So I work with a lot of kids that are in the uh, ward of the state. So a lot of them are in a residential group home or a treatment facility. A lot of times it's not even dealing with things that are dealing with them. Like a lot of them have been taken out of their house for different reasons. Uh, maybe their parents have abused them physically, sexually. Maybe they have been the abuser of siblings or something. So that for some reason they're out of the house. A lot of them have what they call behavior issues. Now, some of the behavior issues can be changed depending on who their mentor is or who they got talking to them or who they have in their corner because we are products of our, of our environment. You have to understand that. So if I'm a kid that was raised in a household with no structure at all, my behavior is probably going to be different than if I grew up in a, a, a home where the parents had structure, they had discipline, they had rules, rules. Some people didn't weren't raised with rules. You, you wouldn't believe it. Right. So with that alone, our kids act different. So where I'm at, I have a total of, I'm responsible, I think 96 kids, right? So out of them 96 kids, every last one of them is different. Some of them you can barely get to talk. Some of them are gonna be perfect. I hate to say it, they're gonna follow every direction you give to them. They're gonna interact with people, right? And then some of them are just gonna be like, they have a, a, a saying that I used to hear growing up, like this kid act like he ain't had no home training, right? And so that's how some of them act. Now, depending on the reasons, you don't know why they act like that. So it could be a birth defect. Now, I hate to see it. Some, some kids were raised by, like, drug-addicted parents. And I believe that really does go into the kid. Can it change? Yes. But I believe at times it comes out. Because I've seen little kids who, why are you acting this way? And you can't understand it. You couldn't put a, a, a reason for it. But it's just not normal. And then you have some kids that just want to be tough and want to be bad, depending on where you're at. And then you have, like I said, the ones that are in a messed up situation and they had nothing to do with nothing. They just happened to be in the wrong place. And the people that were looking over them were not looking over. Them. So mm -hmm. we have a whole mixture. But even to go on back to the book of uh, how to eat to live, a lot of that is our foods. Now, kids are different than I am this day. First off, when I was young, I feel we look like teenagers growing up. Ten, you see a 15-year-old boy nowadays, and he's way bigger than I am, and I'm 6'2", right? Uh, almost 200 pounds. But you have the kids for different reasons. You have some that are extremely big, the females too, the girls too. And then you have some that are obese and stuff. Like when we grew up, we had physical fitness. We had education. We had PE in our school classes. 
connected. I think we went to school every single day. We went to recess the same day. We, we played before and after school. We ran a lot, round a lot. We did a lot of physical activity. Nowadays, I believe here in Memphis, Tennessee, they go to uh, gym class like once a week, about 45 minutes, an hour or something like that. So as you see our kids now, they're, a lot of them are obese. A lot of them are out of weight. Uh, they sit behind video games, play video games most of the day. They don't go outside like we did. Now, that's for many reasons. Uh, maybe depending on where you live is violent, so you don't go outside, or maybe the parents are not around, so nobody's supervising, so you have to stay in the house. Whatever it is, our kids are uh, pretty much out of shape now compared to how they used to be when I was growing up. And so with the kids that I see now, I believe everything plays a part. Uh, as far as their diet goes, I believe if they were in better shape, uh, they would think different. That the, the, the food, it, it, it goes with not necessarily mental illnesses, but self-esteem. So if, if I'm a kid that I'm overweight or I'm ex extremely skinny or something like that, I might feel some kind of way about my, my body or my shape or my physique or my whatever. And if you had a proper diet, I believe that would change a lot of stuff. If, if a kid got into the gym and, and got physically active, like that's one thing that I do too here is like, I like to call it holistic health, but I talk to people on all different levels. Why do you act the way you act? What can we do to change this behavior? You know that this is not the way that you're going to be successful in society. Uh, even with your physical appearance, are you proud of how you look? Are you getting teased at school? What would make you feel better? Some of them, I just want to lose some weight. So that alone to make a person feel better. I want to look good in my clothes. That alone makes somebody feel better. So, uh, yeah, it's just a lot to it. I probably can talk all day. <laughs> With social media and um, the images that the are actually given to what we should look like, how does that affect the people that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis? When they, on a self-esteem basis, do they, do they aspire to look like a certain way or do they aspire to eat like a certain way or do they want to be celebrities like they see on Instagram? I mean, what sort of pattern of behavior do you see coming through? So once again, everybody's different. You know, uh, I, I do believe that social media has messed up our perception of how people are supposed to look. Everybody wants what they are not. I hate to say it like that. Even myself. Now, a lot of people will look at me and say, I'll trade, trade places with you in a second. I like the way your shape look, but I still see imperfections in myself. Right. Why? Because mm -hmm. I look on social media and I see people that got bodies like I want and I don't have it, even though mm -hmm. other people would say, I want your body. So you just have to be happy with yourself because if you pick yourself apart for every flaw or something that you're not, you'll be doing it all day long. We all have flaws. We all wish we could be a little better than what we are, but I just tell everybody, be grateful for what you have because it could always be worse. It could. And as fast as it arrived, it could be taken away from us. So if you had a, um some advice to give to others on a diet basis and a physical exercise basis, what would that advice be? So my, my advice that I give to most people, because I don't really try to turn people vegan, but when they ask me, how do I eat? I explain to them why I eat the way that I do. And I'll tell everybody, don't starve yourself. Don't try to go on a diet where you say, okay, I'm going to be vegan tomorrow. If I'm a person that I eat pork, I eat chicken, I eat fish, I eat everything, I eat beef. Don't say I'm going to be vegetarian tomorrow because it's not going to work. It's like, you're going to get hungry and you're going to be like, what am I going to eat? And it's going to be that convenience food. So start knocking out things one at a time. If you truly want to become a vegan or something like that. So cut out the pork first, right? Now I have beef. I got chicken. I have turkey. I have fish. I have all kinds of different options where I can still eat comfortable, but I've cut pork out of my diet. Next, cut the beef out and I still have options, and it'll make it a lot easier than to say, okay, today I'm just going to be a vegetarian, and you work your way to becoming a vegetarian. But most people, and I, I hate to say it like this, most people know how they're supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't need anybody to tell them how to eat healthy. They know what they're eating. They know what they're putting in their body. And some people, not that they don't care at the time, but it's discipline. It's hard. And then it depends on your circle and the people that are around you too. If I'm a person that decides that I want to be, okay, say I'm a person that still lives at home, right? And I say, I want to be vegetarian. I want to be vegan. However, mom cooks every day. 
<laughs> mom's not cooking for me. Mom's not cooking vegetarian, but it looks so good. So, <laughs> so that's how I kind of am not successful because the people around me are not doing the same thing I am. So you have to kind of be around like-minded people also. That's why these vegan groups, uh, other people or to know friends and stuff that are on the same journey as you, it's always better. That's the same thing with fitness. If, if I work out by myself every single day, it's way more difficult than if I have a group of people that work out with me. If I have a group of people that's going to motivate me and say, come on, or make sure that I'm sticking with my vegan diet, yes. Or if I slip, they don't worry about it. Come on, we're going to get right back on it. That's going to help me out a lot more if I'm trying to, than if I'm trying to do it by myself. So I've noticed on your Facebook page that there's a lot of motivational quotes. What motivates you and how do you motivate others? I know that nobody's going to motivate me like I motivate myself. So a lot of my quotes, they're really personal to myself. It'll be stuff that I see that it just makes me get up and want to go work out or want to go do something else, not to stay in the same place. So like I said, even I take care of myself, right? So different times I'm working two, three jobs, uh, still getting clients in here and still trying to be happy, even if life is not always going the way you expect it to go, you know? So I post a lot of motivational quotes. Now, other people see it and they always tell me, you're very inspiring and thank you to help me get through my day and stuff. And that's a great thing. But I'm helping myself get through my day too, you know? And and I love it when I see other people and I still have people now that they'll send me posts like that, you know, just because they know that that's the type of things I look for and stuff like that. And it always does a great job. They always pop up in the right time. One of the things um, I'd like to um, ask you is, What's the number one piece of advice that you would give people entering the um, fitness industry at the moment or entering the fitness field or wanting to improve their mental capacity and their physique? What, 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 what would you tell them? Where, where, where do they start? So with everything, a, a person has to want to do for themselves, okay? Um, so I'd said a little bit about this earlier. If you're tired of the way things are going, you'll change it. Now, nothing is going to be easy. I hate to say it. Like, nothing is easy for me, but you have to have that dream and that mind that knowing that everything will change. Now, you can wait a year from now and decide you want to change, or you can go ahead and be already at that change by the year. So depending on what you want to do, if you want to lose weight and you look at yourself in the mirror every single day and you're not satisfied, there's no reason for you to keep looking at yourself in the mirror and not being satisfied. So at the same time next year, if you're not satisfied, that's on you. That's how I look at it. You know, it's like, because you had a whole year where you could have changed everything about it. Like, that's one thing that I keep saying. People know what they are supposed to be doing. If a person is out of shape and out of weight, uh, overweight, now they might not know how exactly to get there, but they know eating different and getting some kind of physical activity is the start. And so the only person that can motivate you to do something is yourself. I see the same thing with people that come into the gym, right? You'll have those people that come into the gym and they say, hey, I want to lose this amount of weight. I want to do this. And a lot of them are not really telling the truth to themselves. A lot of them, it sounds good. And they really meant it when they said it. But when they start working, it's a little difficult. And they realize I'll never lose 100 pounds. Well, that's what they believe. They really can because I'm saying people who in their mindset say I'm about to lose a hundred pounds and they never quit. Guess what they do? They're going to get to that hundred pounds because they didn't ever quit until they get to the hundred pounds. But a person that says, uh, this is too hard. Uh, I can't do it. Or I lost five pounds, but no, I ain't, ain't no way you're not going to do it. The same thing with me. When I got on that bar and I started learning tricks, one point in time, it was like fear in my mind. Like I can't do that. As soon as I stopped saying I can't do something, I started trying it. And once I started trying it, it started getting fun. It started being easy. And I started getting them like back to back. So that's when everything, if, if people want to stop, say, smoking cigarettes. Yes, it's going to be difficult. But can you do it? Yes. Now, it's easier if you have somebody to help you with it. If I see you with a cigarette and I smack it out your hand every time or I take them and I hide them for you, I make sure you don't have no cigarette money or whatever it may be. I can help you. But at the end of the day, the only way you're truly going to be successful is that is if you just tell yourself, I'm fed up with this. And I understand that there's health issues attached to it. And I want to live long uh, life. And a lot of times with different things, it takes a doctor to tell them they have to do it for them to understand it. It takes something serious. It takes a heart attack for me to realize I need to change my eating habits. It takes for, uh, like I said, something medical. 
usually for me to want to change it. Now, a lot of people, they don't like the way they look, but a lot of people are not going to do stuff about it. I know people right now who've lost 100 pounds, you know, so it can happen. Well, David Goggins is a very good example of hitting rock bottom and getting up and fighting his demons and fighting his fear and saying, you know what? I'm not going to stay down here. I'm going to get up. I'm going to fight it and I'm going to do it. And that's the sort of um, theory behind your practice that just do it. Don't wait a year. Just do it. Change your diet. Get some physical exercise. Get the sleep and the water and everything else that you need. But whatever you do, just do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that really works. Uh, there's no other way to say it. Like, like I said, most people know what they're supposed to be doing. It's just if it's a choice for them to do it or not. Uh, same thing with me. If I set a goal to myself, I usually going to accomplish that goal. Um, it, it's, it's seldom that I'm going to quit at something. And I, I try to instill that in other people. You know, um, the kids that I work with, a lot of them feel like there's no hope. Because like I said, I have kids that are with me that have did nothing wrong at all. Like I said, they, they were taken out of their household because their parents uh, either did something to them or now they can't be in the household. And so all they want is a loving family. Some of them have no behavior issues at all. They listen, they, they, but they're just in a mess of situation. I'm here and I'm not around family and it sucks really. You know, and so I always tell them, it's like, man, things happen for a reason, you know, and even though like some kids, you know, they've been physically abused and everything beat and all this, they still know that that's home, that's love. So they still want to be around their family, even though they know that's not the best situation for them. And mm-hmm. so I do wish the best for all of them. I know it's, it's good places out there and good homes for people who, who take care of people and they'll take them in eventually. But I try to let them understand that, yes, it's messed up that you guys are not with your family right here, but some people, for some people, this is the best place for them. They have, you know, they are able to eat every day. They have a roof over their head. They have people like me to come in and talk to you. Now, a lot of times they don't want to hear from us because we're still like an authority figure, you know, but you'll get those ones that they understand that we are there for them and stuff like that. Great bit of advice there. So your number one bit of advice is just see the positive in everything and just do it. One thing I can say uh, is, like I said, going vegan or plant based, I believe that everybody needs to do it. Um, I'm going to go a little deeper into the meat and the things that I believe about meats and why a person shouldn't eat meat. And this is just for me. This is my personal preference. Right. Everything has everything living has a soul. Right. Attached to it. I believe a pig has that. I believe a cow has that. They live lives. You've seen uh videos of cows running and playing in the snow and licking their tongue out and oh it's snowflakes out here right they're having fun but that's not something that you think of a cow doing right you think of a cow just for some reason just out in the grazing and stuff like that you don't really see the personality of them and stuff like that like probably like a little calf or something he's having fun the same thing when they're going to the slaughterhouse and they about to die that fear is instilled in them you'll see them drop dead of heart attacks and stuff like that I really believe that you're taking that personality or that soul of whatever you're putting inside your body and that's becoming a part of you. And like I said, these are not facts. This is just me thinking. And so I believe if I have a, a, a sickly pig, right? I don't know if that pig was healthy. I don't know if he was one of the top stallions or whatever you call a, a pig. Or I don't know if he was on the verge of dying and had all kinds of illnesses before they killed him. I don't know. But that meat is going to probably taste the same as the other meat of a healthy, a healthy pig, right? And so even with that, I, I don't know what's in, in it and what kind of sicknesses and illnesses can be passed off from food to food and stuff like that. So I choose not to eat it. Same thing you holding the puppy right there, right? I asked this question to people. Would you eat a cat? Would you eat a dog? They say, no, why not? Because it's a pet. It's a piece of meat. It's an animal. If I cut that, hate to say it like this, don't think I'm gruesome or nothing like that. If I cut that dog up and season it real good and put it in some rice, like some vegetable fried rice, and told you it was beef, you wouldn't know no difference. You would know the taste tastes like some meat with some seasoning on it. Because seasoning is really what you're tasting. You're not tasting the actual meat. If, if right now if somebody fried some chicken for you and put no seasoning on it and gave it to you to eat, it would be disgusting because it didn't have any seasoning on it. It wouldn't taste like 
seasoned fried chicken. So you're tasting it. The same thing as vegan food and stuff like that. I can make some some portobello mushrooms, some jackfruit, taste whatever, taste like whatever I wanted to. And that's because of the seasoning on it. Now, it's still a fruit. It's still a, a vegetable or something like that. But I can give it that taste of uh, I've had cauliflower wings that taste like chicken. Right. Uh, different things like that. And it's the seasoning. It's the taste of it. But people don't think like that. If I if I ask somebody if they eat a cat or dog, they say no. But I can guarantee you they wouldn't know the difference. No, I know lots of people um, judge what they're eating by the taste. And obviously, as a vegan, you don't eat eggs, but you can make pretty good scrambled egg vegan style. And it comes down to one thing, black sea salt. It tastes like egg. So it is about the seasoning and it is about how creative you can get. And vegan food doesn't have to be boring. And it, it isn't, it isn't boring. Most people think about when they, when they ask, when you say you're vegan, they're like, what you want, some lettuce, some carrots? <laughs> so this has been an absolute great talk, a great meeting, Clarence. And thank you very much for joining me here on the Vegan Plant-Based Summit. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you.